All right, in this lecture, we're going to talk about the Mohr circle and the pole method. And these are graphical methods for solving the uh, coordinate transformation equation in two dimensions that we've already talked about in lesson 4.1. Uh, so it turns out that um, if you do a coordinate transformation and you plot the, the original stress condition and the rotated stress condition, so for example, let's say that we have some, whoops, let me undo that, didn't mean to draw. Let's say that we have a diagram here where we know the stress is on horizontal and vertical planes, and then we, we rotate the coordinate system through some angle gamma and we get new stresses with a hat, right, on these rotated coordinate planes. Uh, the stress condition plotted here for the horizontal vertical planes and the stress condition on the rotated planes would lie on a circle, right? And if you were to rotate it by any particular angle, the points would always lie on the Mohr circle. So the Mohr circle is really a graphical representation of the two-dimensional stress rotation tensor equations. And it just so happens that if you rotate the stresses by an angle gamma, all you need to do is plot the original points on the Mohr circle, draw a bar that connects those two points, rotate that bar by an angle 2 gamma, draw another bar at that angle, and then the new points on the circle are the stresses on those rotated coordinates. All right, so it's pretty easy for us to graphically solve this problem. Now, uh, I'll also point out that the major and minor principal stresses, sigma 1 major principal stress and sigma 3 minor principal stress, we derive those as lying on the planes where the shear stresses were zero. So you can always rotate by some amount until the bar would lie on a horizontal plane like that and the shear stresses are zero. And so sigma 1 is the point where the Mohr circle intersects the x-axis at tau equals 0 and is bigger. And sigma 3 is the point where the Mohr circle intersects the x-axis and sigma is smaller. Okay, so it's also easy for us to solve for principal stresses by drawing the Mohr circle. Uh, okay, and then in terms of the invariants, p and q, it's easy for us to solve those two. The value of p, the mean stress, is just found at the center of the Mohr circle. So where tau is equal to zero, you got a point right there. Sigma at that point is equal to p. And then the deviator stress, or the deviatoric stress invariant, is equal to the diameter of the Mohr circle, right? So you can kind of see that these two invariants tell you all you need to know to draw a circle. If you know the center point and the diameter, you can draw the circle so you know the full stress condition. And then I've redrawn sigma one and sigma three here just for clarity. All right, now let's talk about sign conventions for drawing a Mohr circle. This is a little bit complicated, a little bit confusing, because we have one sign convention for um, solving our mechanics-based equation and just putting numbers into a Cauchy stress tensor. Let's review that real quickly. We'll come back up here and let's look at this diagram, for example, and zoom in on it. Uh, okay, so what we said before was that a positive stress is one that would cause the element to rotate in such a way that the sides are sloping in a positive direction. Like that slope right there would be positive. All right, the element that I've drawn here would actually deform the other way, right? Notice that sigma zx is pointed to the left, so it would actually tend to deform the element this way. Let me try and draw this before that thing disappears. There we go. So this is actually negative. Our Cauchy stress tensor here would be um, sigma x x minus sigma x z minus sigma z x sigma z z, right? Because um, sigma z z and sigma x x are both in compression, they're positive, and then these shear stresses are negative because they tend to deform the element in a way that that slope would be negative, d, d z d x, right? So here's uh, let me fully define this equation. This is sigma equals that tensor. All right, now, um, when we plot a Mohr circle, one of the shear stress components is going to be positive, and one of the shear stress components is going to be negative, right? We always have to make one above the, the x-axis and one below. So which one do we plot positive? Which one do we plot negative? Well, 
uh, we can't use the original fundamental mechanics definition because um, both of them are negative in this case, right? The shear stresses are, it's symmetric, so these two have to be the same. So uh, here's how we do it. We, we define positive shear stress as being a shear stress that rotates the element in the counterclockwise direction. So here you've got this thing rotating around that way. Um, now, of course, you can never have a stress condition that consists of all four stress components acting counterclockwise. That, that's just not possible because this little soil element would not be in moment equilibrium. It would spin around like a propeller. So in real life, one of them has to be this way and the other one has to be opposite, right? They have to act opposite. If one's counterclockwise, the other one's clockwise. So when we come up here and look at this diagram again, right, notice that this one is going counterclockwise and this one is going clockwise, right? So for more circle, this one that's counterclockwise would be positive. This one that is clockwise would be negative. And that's exactly how we've drawn them, right? This sigma zx component is the positive one. The sigma, sorry, sigma xz component is the negative one. And that's how we draw our more circle. And the reason why it's important to get these right is that you want to be able to know from which bar you're rotating, right? If you got the shear stresses wrong, you would plot one point down here and one up there. And the circle itself would still have the same diameter and center, so it wouldn't influence the invariance but it would influence the stresses you derive from coordinate rotations. So you want to be sure to get the sign conventions right. So anyway, just come back to this if you're ever confused when you're drawing a Mohr circle. Positive counterclockwise, negative clockwise. Um, so here's an example, right? We have, let's say, sigma zz is 10, sigma xx is 5, and then we have a positive 3 for our um, shear stress, right? So we can write a Couchy stress tensor, this would be, say, 5, positive 3, positive 3, and 10. And let's put a coordinate system, x and z. This would be equal to sigma xx, sigma xz, sigma zx, sigma zz. All right, so we've got this stress condition, and notice that these are positive because they would tend to deform the element such that the slope is to the right, and that's a positive slope in xz space. If we go to draw the more circle, we have to decide which one's positive and which one's negative. Okay, the one associated with 10 right here is rotating the element clockwise, so that one's negative. It gets plotted down here. So we have a 10, negative 3, whereas the one that's associated with the 5 is counterclockwise, so it's positive. So you get a 5, positive 3 right there. Okay, and then I haven't drawn the, uh, the bar in between or anything like that. I'm just illustrating the sign convention here. Uh, okay, now the last thing I'll talk about in this lecture is the pole method. So uh, the pole is really a useful uh, property of a Mohr circle for quickly finding stresses on any particular coordinate orientation that you want. Um, and so it turns out that every Mohr circle has a unique point that we're going to call the pole, and it's useful for defining stresses on any plane once you've identified the pole. So the property of the pole is that a line drawn through the pole intersects the Mohr circle at a point that defines the stress condition acting on planes perpendicular to that line. <laughs> now that's a lot of words, I know, it's hard to kind of understand what I'm saying just based on words. You have to go through and do it a few times to really kind of get it. But um, let's just go through an example from, you know, we're going to use this same block diagram right there with the 10, 5, and 3 numbers. And we've plotted our Mohr circle here. So it's the same Mohr circle that we had before. Then what we're going to do, so let me walk you through the steps for finding the pole. Step one, draw the Mohr circle. Be sure to put the points in the right um, sign convention on the circle in the right spot. Then the second thing you do is now you draw a line from one of the stress points in a direction perpendicular to the line of action of that stress. Okay, well let's go back up here and we'll pick this one, 5, 3, we've got that point. Uh, the line of action of that stress is horizontal, right? The normal stress is horizontal. The plane on which that stress is acting is vertical, 
the stress direction itself is horizontal. So we're going to draw a line parallel to the um, face that it acts on, perpendicular to the line of action of the normal stress. That's a vertical line in this case, right? So we come in here and draw this dashed red vertical line, and you can just draw it. It doesn't have to stop on the circle. You can just, it doesn't even have to stop here. You can just draw a vertical line like this, right? Um, okay, and then you do the same thing for the 10 3. That's this one. This is a vertical stress acting on a horizontal plane. So we have to draw a horizontal line, right? It's perpendicular to the normal stress, parallel to the face. So we come in here, draw a horizontal line from this stress point here. And then those two lines will intersect on the circle. Okay, if you draw these two lines and they somehow don't intersect on the circle, you haven't drawn your circle very well. It's a graphical solution. You have to draw a perfect circle. Go back, get a compass, draw it the right way. The point should lie right on the circle, and they intersect at a point that's equal to the pole, right? So that we're now through um, step four. Lines two and three intersect at the pole. So we've identified this unique point on this Mohr circle called the pole. Then step five is where the pole becomes valuable to us. So if we draw a line through the pole, at any angle that we're interested in, it will intersect the Mohr circle at a point that defines the stress conditions acting on that plane. So let's say that we were solving a slope stability problem and we wanted to know what is the shear stress and normal stress acting on a plane that's inclined at this angle, right? Um, well, we would just draw a line from the pole at that angle and where it intersects the Mohr circle gives us the normal stress and shear stress acting on, on this uh, line. Right? So it really is a useful property when you're doing graphical solutions to, uh, to solve. And notice that the pole also works for, for these stress points. You know, this is how we derived it. Let's say, for example, you wanted to calculate vertical and horizontal stresses. Well, you could draw a, uh, sorry, vertical stress, vertical normal stress and shear stress acting on a, on a horizontal plane. Well, you could draw a horizontal line because you're interested in a horizontal plane here. And that intersects the Mohr circle at 10 and 3, which is exactly equal to the vertical and, and shear stress acting on a horizontal plane right here, right? Uh, okay, so we've gone through all of that, the pole method, the Mohr circle. Just keep in mind that these are graphical solutions. They have to be done, kind of drawn perfectly in order to get the right answer by reading things from the uh, x and y axes. And uh, they're also two-dimensional, so we're ignoring the out-of-plane stress or the intermediate principal stress in these solutions. If you keep those things in mind, you can definitely use the Mohr circle and the pole to solve soil mechanics problems pretty easily.